right, good morning, everybody. Um, well, it's okay. I don't really need this. We have, oh. we have three presenters today, so we're going to get started right now. Our first presenter is our chief resident, Krista Kennard. Um, I think many of you know that Krista is a skilled hunter. Oh. Okay? But you may not have known that the largest animal that she's killed was a four-point bull elk that she used <coughs> in from a long distance and shot at a distance of possibly 700 yards. So, um, you know, that gives us a whole new appreciation for her. <laughs> All right, she's going to give a, a case presentation. Okay, so briefly, I have to, I, I'm going to be presenting this patient of Dr. Mifflin's. I'll go over radiation um, complications to the orbit and to the eye, and then we'll open it up for discussion on what to do with this patient. So it's a case of an extruded intraocular lens. The 75-year-old gentleman, he had, um, well, he presented to Dr. Mifflin Clinic on the 28th of February saying that something looked different with his eye. And it had looked different for about 10 days. And then he decided to say something to his wife. And his wife was like, oh, yes, there's something in the middle of your eye. We need to go to the eye doctor today. So then he went in to see Dr. Mifflin. Um, he wasn't having any pain. There is no discharge. And he's light perception, vision, legally blind in that eye. So he's not noticing any um, differences. So at that time, an exam was done, pictures were taken, he was put on Vigamox, and we've been deciding what to do since then. He was seen last week as well, same thing, the exam hadn't changed. I didn't see him personally at that point in time, but looking at the notes, he was still not having any discharge or pain. He does tape his eye at night, um, but the plan was just to continue to observe and treat him with the topical antibiotics. A little bit more on his history. He has a history of conjunctival squamous uh, uh, cell carcinoma that was treated with high dose radiation back uh, over the periods of 2007, 2008. And this resulted in a problem with severe neurotrophic uh, keratopathy. Um, he actually, he developed a cataract from the radiation. He ended up having a cataract surgery in May of 2008. And then he's had a series of corneal melts, as you can see. So he had a melt in 2008, it was glued. Then he had a perforation, it resulted, he ended up with a corneal transplantation. He had a conge graft. He had another ulcer, another perforation, another perforation. Um, and now he has this extruded intraocular lens. And this is, you know, despite uh, the best management and the patient being compliant as well. And this, sorry, there, he had also has had a cataract surgery in his left eye, and that was just done in uh, December of 2012. And as for the um, cataract in his right eye, it was done at an outside facility. So his past medical history was, is really not contributory. He does have a peripheral neuropathy in the area of his trigeminal nerve, but he doesn't have diabetes and really nothing else that would contribute to poor wound healing. Um, his surgeries are primarily ocular, and you know, his social history uh, doesn't contribute anything, no crack cocaine. Um, and his medications, he's on multivitamin, vitamin E, vitamin C, um, gabapentin for his neuropathy, um, and his family history is not contributory. So these are some of the images that were taken when he first came in. This side L negative. <laughs> but it doesn't look great. So there is a thin is a thin layer of tissue over there? Well, there's a membrane Yeah. Yeah, you can kind of see it on that side view. All right, so just to talk a little bit about um, radiation, 
It's used for a lot of different entities in the orbit and in the eye. It's used for retinal blastoma, melanoma, you know, squamous cell carcinoma, obviously. We don't need to go over the entire list. Um, just some information on the damage. It can be direct or indirect. Uh, the direct damage occurs if the radiation is aimed directly, you know, at the target tissue, which is in the eye or in the orbit, um, and it's directly over it. You can have indirect damage from an external beam, and this can be from uh, carcinomas in the sinuses or in the CNS, and, you know, the eye is caught in between. The mechanism of action of the radiation, uh, it's electroned or some sort of excited particulate. Um, it causes free radicals that result in DNA strand breakage, and then the cells essentially can't replicate. But this is not specific for just the cancerous cells, and so you do get damage of the surrounding tissues. And there's two different, two main forms of administration. Uh, the brachytherapy is something we're probably more familiar with, and that's where you have uh, a plaque that's been impregnated with a radioactive isotope, and that's placed directly <coughs> over the tumor. Or you can have the teletherapy where it's remote and the beam is directed at the target. Uh, now, in terms of the dosing, uh, it's recorded in grays. Previously, it was in rads. One gray is 100 rad. And that is the amount of energy required to deliver one joule of energy to one kilogram of tissue. And the dosage depends on what your goal is, whether it's palliation or cure. Uh, it also depends on the type of the tumor, the sensitivity of the tumor to radiation, and size of tumor uh, tolerance of the surrounding tissue, and the patient's uh, overall physical condition. Uh, diabetes, collagen vascular diseases, those things can um, adversely affect the, the radiation or increase the damage that you get. And typically, squamous cell carcinoma is treated with around 20 to 60 grays. This is just a table to give you an idea of some of the cumulative doses that you would see for radiation in the conjunctiva um, for that can cause conjunctivitis, keratitis, and you can see that with increasing doses, um, you can you get more and more effects. So the radiation-induced damage, it can be acute or late. Um, some of the early changes, you get transient eyelid erythema, you get matterosis, blepharitis, conjunctivitis, and this results from you know damage to the tissue, but also loss of goblet cells, and then you get keratinization of the epithelium and punctate keratitis is typically an acute early change. And then later changes, you get lid hyperpigmentation, you get changes of the lid such as ectropion and entropion, you can get punctal occlusion, lymphedema, and then the keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis sicca, which is what our um, patient has been having troubles with, um, and corneal changes. And this results from a multitude of things. You can, you get atrophy of the lacrimal meibomian glands or tear film. Um, the high-dose radiation, which is what our patient had, they, there's been studies that have shown that patients just become unresponsive to therapy. Um, there's keratitis, loss of the limbal stem cells, so you can't uh, re-epithelialize the defects, and then conjunctivalization of the cornea. There's also cranial nerve dysfunction, and this can be from damage to cranial nerve 5, as well as cranial nerve 7, and then cataracts, retinopathy, optic neuropathy, contracted sockets. So it can do a lot of damage in this area. Um, the damage is dependent on dose and also, as I mentioned before, the patient's systemic health. They get more damage to surrounding tissues with diabetes and connective tissue diseases. Also, if they have concurrent uh, chemotherapy, that increases the effect of the radiation. The most sensitive uh, orbital or ocular tissue is the lens. And some papers have shown that you get changes in the lens with just two grays. And then cornea, retina, optic nerve, and then sclera and orbit. With the lens, the changes that start, you get uh, opacification posteriorly and centrally, and that's how it starts. The radiation retinopathy, you start seeing around 50 grays. The earliest signs of radiation retinopathy is caught in wool spots. And this does look very much like diabetic retinopathy. It's treated like diabetic retinopathy. But you get the capillary non-perfusion, the micro 
aneurysms, telangiectetic tetic vessels, the endothelial cells that are damaged first, specifically the capillary endothelial cells, then the pericytes, then larger endothelial cells, and it is slowly progressive. The radiation optic neuropathy occurs with a little bit higher dose at 60 to 70 grays, and typically you see disc pallor and splinter hemorrhages or more of a retrobulbar effect, but then you get the visual acuity loss and the color vision defects. Treatments um, for radiation retinopathy, it's similar to diabetic retinopathy for kind of focusing on our patient for the dry eye, lubricants, tears, ointments. You can do brief courses of steroids for inflammation. You don't want to do long-term steroids because of corneal melt. If you can try punctal occlusion, tarsorophy, bandage contact lenses. Uh, one of the papers I looked at said that they use rigid gas permeable lenses which are then glued onto the cornea and this is effective. <coughs> um, for small perforations, you can glue the cornea and then for larger perforations, then you'll need transplants, conjunctival grafts, amniotic grafts. So everything that our patient has had and now his eye is tricycle and he has an extruded lens. So back to our patient, you know, what to do with this. Keep observing, treating with antibiotics, put glue over the area, remove the lens. I'll open it up for discussion.
great Christmas. Thank you very much.